So I just want to let you guys know, thus far, my Christmas sweater has garnered the reaction that I was looking for. I've been called Perry Cuomo. I've been called Mr. Rogers. So we'll see who could come up with the best, best name. Hey, before we get started this morning, just one thing I, I just wanted to emphasize. Um, really at the heart of our Christmas Eve service this year it is really to be able to reach out to our friends, our family members, our neighbors. And uh, we do recognize with everything that's going on and the COVID numbers spiking that a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with that. And one of the real great blessings of this season has been uh, our AV team and, and what they've done to, to put everything together. Um, just the setup has been amazing. And uh, they've just been all been so faithful. Uh, the Lepard's leading this ministry. But, um, but taking advantage of, if you have a friend or family member and they're like, ah, I'm not willing to come out. If they're able, if they're willing to say, hey, we're all going to sit down together and we're going to, you know, sing together in our, in our living room. And we're going to, and we're going to sing together and we're going to listen to the Christmas story and we're going to hear the message of the gospel. Um, that's just a, uh, such a huge win and something we haven't been able to do in years past. So please take advantage uh, of that resource, whether it's, of course, we'd love for you to be here in the flesh, but uh, if you go ahead and, and do that and, and be able to share that uh, with your, your friends and family, uh, it's just a really great blessing. Uh, this morning, we're going to be concluding our Christmas series, The Gift of Faith, where we've spent the last few weeks me- making our way uh, through the, the Christmas narrative, looking at how Christmas points us to the greatest gift of all time, the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, We began in Luke chapter 1 two weeks ago uh, where the angel Gabriel visits Mary and he delivers the news that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary would miraculously conceive, give birth, and be the mother to the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so in studying that passage, we walked away just marveling at the grace of God and at Mary's humility and the miraculous nature of the gift of faith. And then we moved on to Matthew chapter 1. The next week, last Sunday, we looked at at, at the, we continued the Christmas story to the house of Joseph, where an angel of the Lord visits Joseph in a dream to tell him to move forward with his marriage to Mary even though she had been found with child and the assumption had been made that Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph. But what we learn is that the child in her womb had been conceived of the Holy Spirit and the child's name will be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so Joseph is given the momentous calling and privilege to serve as the the adoptive father of the Messiah. And we, we, we looked at how the gift of faith is rooted in the love of God, and that the greatest blessing we find at Christmas is the, is the gift of God's presence in our lives. But that's what Christmas is all about. And, and so now as we look to, to conclude our, our Christmas series this year, this morning, uh, we're going to open up God's Word together. And what we're going to do is we're going to look to, to, to define what is the gift of faith. And we're going to explore its biblical basis, and then we're going to finish up by looking at the results of our faith in our everyday lives. And so in order to do that, we're going to answer the following three questions in our study this morning. Number one is, what is faith? And maybe better put, what is faith according to the Word of God? And then we're going to look at, can we trust God to be faithful? How, how, how do we know that God's going to be faithful? How do we come to that conclusion? And then lastly, how does the gift of faith work in our lives? And so with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started by looking at our first question, what is faith according to the Bible? Now when it comes to the question of trying to wrap our arms around the definition of biblical faith, for an illustration, what came to my mind was, and I know it's difficult to think about baseball right now with snow and ice on the ground, but, but maybe this will warm us up a little bit. But, but really what came to my mind was the difference between the fan bases of our two local professional baseball teams, the Mets and the Yankees. You know, I, I have one of each in my house, as you can see. And, 
you know, they, they couldn't be any more different. It, it, it's, it's well known that the motto of the New York Mets is, you got to believe, right? Mets fans, you got to believe. And, and for the Mets fan, what, what I have found is, is that you got to believe. I mean, it might as well be serenity now. Because it's almost like this coping mechanism for Mets fans. For I mean, the Mets fan, I, I have a lot of admiration for the Mets fan because the Mets fan is it's a, a downtrodden group of people. You guys have really had to go through a lot because, you know, every team, they have their fair share of losses. But the Mets, I mean, they have a habit of consistently losing games in just spectacular fashion. I mean, they've made it a, an art form, a drama. And again, I, I have respect for Mets fans. Mets fans, you guys, you guys are survivors. That's what you guys are. Because you always have to prepare for the worst if you're a Mets fan. And, and just a quick example, 2007, right? First place, Seven game lead with only 17 games left to play, and yet somehow they managed to let the, the season slip away. And you think, right, that can only happen once, right? No, the very next year, they did it to you again. It's like Charlie Brown with the football. I mean, I, I, my heart goes out to you guys. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Mets history. But the other thing with the Mets is, is that it seems like every year, I don't know if this is true or not, but it just seems like the Mets are always in the running for leading the league in blown saves. And if you don't know what a blown save is, it's, this isn't an exact definition, but it's essentially refers to that you're, you're ahead in the ninth inning, the, the last inning you play, and then, then you blow the lead. And so it's not just a matter of losing, but it's getting your heart ripped out just on a regular basis. And so Mets fans will be the first to tell you that no matter what pitcher they get to close out the ninth inning, it's, you know, Benitez, Heilman, Looper, Familia, Diaz. I feel like I'm naming Santa's reindeer here. For the past 30 years, it doesn't matter who it is. It's like they put on that Mets jersey and there's just like relief pitcher kryptonite in it or something. And so, so you can understand why Mets fans, you're always on edge and filled with anxiety, especially when they're watching their team you know, in a close game, when it, when it gets down, when it really gets down to the end of a close game. And it's because of their team's history that it's kind of conditioned the Met fan to always fear the worst. That's kind of the, the embodiment that they've taken on. However, you go from Queens to the Bronx, right, and, and you have the, the Met fans who are so lovable, and then the exact opposite is the case with the Yankee fans, that the Yankee fans are always considered to be what? Arrogant. That's what you say. You know, people, they really, you know, some people really, they don't like Yankee fans. I don't know why. You know, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I'm one of the rare people. I, I want both of the New York teams to do well. But, but they're, they're, Yankee fans tend to be considered arrogant because they're so confident in their team that in contrast to the Mets, the Yankees have had just these litany of Hall of Fame clutch players. Uh, they, they've had these laundry lists of, of great moments and as well as the most World Series titles of any team in history. And so that, that's conditioned their fans to have this assurance and this confidence that they're going to pull through no matter what. Whether they're ahead a couple of runs or down a couple of runs, it doesn't matter. That they're going to pull through, especially when it matters most. And so the point I'm trying to make is, is that when it comes to having faith, when we, when we look at the definition of faith in the Bible, it's not some arbitrary mental state that you can just muster up like you got to believe. I mean, let's face it, no matter how many times you tell yourself you got to believe, it doesn't help you believe anymore. It doesn't really give you any more assurance. Uh, it doesn't help with any anxiety. It's not so, so biblical faith, it, it's not some empty hoping against hope. But it's a logical position that we've arrived at based on knowledge and experience. We read in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so what we see here is that, the, that, that biblical faith, that it is an intellectual response grounded in reason that spurs us to action. Okay, so it's an intellectual response grounded in reason that spurs us to action. So, so let me give you an example. All of you guys right now are exercising faith. You don't even realize it. You have faith 
in the chair that you're sitting in right now. That, that because of the knowledge and the past experience that you have with sitting in, in chairs, that, that you've made this decision that, that this chair, it's going to hold my weight. Now, think about it. We have to recognize that there, when we sit in a chair, there is a certain risk that we are taking. That there is a chance that there could be, I don't know, a missing screw. Maybe the, the welding's broken. Maybe the chair got damaged when we stacked them last week. And so you can't be 100% certain that it will hold your weight when you sit in the chair. There's a possibility that exists that the chair could collapse when you sit in it. It's, it's been known to happen. But you decided to put your faith in that chair. Why? Well, it passes the eye test. It looks sturdy. It it, it looks like a chair that's going to do the job. It's held your weight every single time you've sat in it in the past. And so, therefore, you have arrived at the logical response based upon its track record that even though there is uncertainty that exists, that you have faith that it will hold you up and it will meet your need. You've made an intellectual response grounded in reason that spurred you to action. That, that I have faith in this chair, so I'm going to sit in it. And moreover, every time we take that step of faith to sit in that chair and it holds our weight, the result is, is that our faith in it grows. It grows more and more. And we have the confidence to continue going to it again and again to meet our needs to the point where we will arrive at the place where we don't even question it anymore because it's become so reliable and and trustworthy to us. And so whether it be with our chair, our favorite baseball team, our relationships, or whatever the case may be, the choice of whether or not to put our faith in something completely lies with the history and the reputation of what we're being called to put our faith in. And so when it comes to God, his track record, how's God's track record? It's absolutely perfect, which should compel us to be continually looking to him in faith, regardless of whatever uncertainty we're facing. And the more we put our trust in him and experience his unfailing love and covenant faithfulness in our lives, the more our faith continues to grow. And so this now brings us to our second question in our study this morning. Can we trust God to be faithful? Well, we read in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with the resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. God has shown us the evidence of his faithfulness throughout redemptive history, which is to serve as the foundation of our faith. Our God has shown us to be trust, trustworthy. And so I want to just make this clear. Contrary to the false notion that biblical faith is some kind of blind faith that is superstitious in nature and flies in the face of all logic and reason because that's what a lot of people falsely think faith is. It's blind faith. What we find is, is that the opposite is true. And so let me make this very clear. Blind faith is not of God. We read of the Bereans in Acts 17 verse 11 that they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so, that the Bereans are applauded in Scripture, that, that they went and they looked for themselves. They examined the Scriptures daily to see, is, is this true that they're, they're working, they're struggling with the Scriptures, they're in the text, bringing these things together, asking God to reveal His truth to Him. And so what we see is, is that our God is a God of reason, logic and order who has revealed himself to us through his word, the Bible, where he gives us evidence of his faithfulness, that he shows us in in his word his will for our lives, and that he is worthy to be trusted, that the Lord encourages encourages us to examine the scriptures daily so that we would not fall into the false philosophies 
worldviews and heresies that are so prominent in our world, especially today with the crazy amount of misinformation and craziness that's going on in our world today. And so blind faith has no place in the life of a Christian. The Bible serves as the catalyst for our faith, recording in its pages the fulfilled prophecies and promises of God that point to God's steadfast love and covenant faithfulness that results in our salvation. And so before we can answer the question whether or not God can be trusted, we first need to answer whether or not the account of God's faithfulness in Scripture is trustworthy. Because if Scripture isn't trustworthy, then you, you got to just throw the whole thing out. And so what I'd like to do is delve a little bit into bibliology and some apologetics this morning in order to answer the question of whether or not the Bible can be trusted. And therefore, whether or not God can be trusted to be faithful. And so what we're going to see is, is just, it's incredible, the overwhelming amount of evidence. And so what I'd like to do first is, is, is to, to look at the strict procedures scribes were required to use in the process of copying the Old Testament. And then we'll move on to the New Testament. And so first, in the Old Testament copying process, there was a particular par parchment that had to be used for every Old Testament scroll made from clean animals. And, and so that, we have that right from the get-go that each col column must first be lined, and if three words were written without the line, the copy was worthless and destroyed. That each column must have no less than 48 words and no more than 60 lines. That no word or letter could be written from memory. The scribe would have an authentic copy before him, and he must read and pronounce aloud each word before writing it. He must wipe the pen before writing God and then bathe each time before he wrote the word, Lord, the covenant name of God that you see in your Bible that is Lord in, in all caps. Specific rules were given in regard to form of letters, spaces between letters, and words on a page, all to be sure that every letter got into the new copy. The scribe counted to the middle letter of each page in each book and then did the same on the new copy to double check the accuracy of the copy. If there was found to be a mistake in one of these areas... The entire scroll would be destroyed. This, is, this could not be uh, any more of a strict and serious process dealing with the Word of God. Now, on top of all, of all that, there are archaeological break, breakthroughs such as the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In Qumran, Israel, 1947, a shepherd boy who was searching for his lost sheep accidentally made one of the greatest archaeological finds of all time when he came across scrolls that dated back to 300 years before the birth of Christ. The scrolls had been remarkably preserved because of the, the dry climate, and, and they were uh, preserved in these, in these clay pots. They were protected. And these scrolls contained every single book of the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. And they all proved to be completely accurate to our present translation. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were brought to the University of Chicago where carbon-14 dating confirmed that they were from the 3rd century B.C. In addition, a large amount of silver coins was found with the scrolls, allowing us to know for sure that they weren't tampered with, as surely someone would have taken them considering the immense value of the coins. Now, when it comes to the authenticity of the New Testament, we have a collection of letters from the early church fathers containing over 86,000 quotes of Scripture, which comes out to be 99.68% of, of our New Testament. Basically, the entire thing except for 11 verses. Now, on top of that, the Bible has more ancient manuscripts supporting its accuracy than any other piece of ancient literature in existence, that nothing else even comes close. And so just to give you a frame of reference, we have around 24,000 ancient manuscript copies of the New Testament. The next closest is the Iliad with 643. 24,643. And so when we take a step back and we look at the incredible evidence, that it's just so overwhelming uh, when, we, when we consider the integrity of the Word of God, the trustworthiness of the Word of God, as well as when we take it and we consider just looking at the Bible as a whole, that it's impossible not to marvel at it. There's a supernatural nature to its integrity as well as to its unity. 
I mean, consider this. It was written over a 1,500-year span by over 40 different authors from every walk of life. You got Moses, a political leader trained in the universities of Egypt. You have Peter, who's a, a, a fisherman. Amos, a herdsman. Joshua, a military general. Nehemiah, a, a cupbearer for the king of Persia. Daniel was a prime minister. Luke was a doctor. Solomon was a king. Matthew was a tax collector for the Roman IRS. Paul was a Pharisee, a Jewish rabbi. It's just incredible. The Bible was written on three different continents, right? Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Yet in spite of its diversity, in every respect, in every respect, there is a supernatural harmony and continuity from the beginning to the end of Scripture that points to its undeniable integrity. That from Genesis to Revelation, there is one subject throughout the Bible that it all points to God's redemption of humanity through his son Jesus, to the praise of his glory. And so the deeper we dig and the more we investigate, the facts and evidence that we discover behind our faith only causes our faith to grow deeper providing for us a stronger foundation in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is such a blessing that we take for granted that all of us living on the other side of the cross, that we have the completed word of God at our very fingertips, that the mystery of the gospel has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ, that, that it's, like, it's like having the, 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 the Bible, it's like being there on the Emmaus Road with Jesus himself. And on the Emmaus Road, we read in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures things concerning himself. That when we open up the word of God, we encounter the word of God and the Holy Spirit tells us it points. It says, look, this whole entire book, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. So the fulfilled prophecies and promises of God are such a significant part of our Christian walk. And it plays such a, a, a significant part at Christmas where we read just last week in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And these, these prophecies go on and on and on. We also, we, we can look at Micah's prophecy Micah 5, 2, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, which was made almost 700 years before the birth of Christ. Now the same holds true for the prophecies concerning Jesus' death and resurrection at the cross, that they're predicted in such incredible detail by Israel's King David in Psalm 22, almost a thousand years before it happened. And there's a similar prophecy by the prophet Isaiah of the suffering servant Messiah made 600 years before the crucifixion. And so what I'm trying to get at is you just can't make this stuff up. And so what I encourage you to do is please, please do your own research. Look up these scriptures. Put the work in. See for yourself whether or not the Bible is true. And God can be trusted. Because on top of our own personal experience of God being trustworthy and always coming through for us in our own lives, we look to the Word of God. And when we, we dig into the Word of God and when we come to realize that God is who He says He is, and we look at the overwhelming evidence that, that, that God never fails to keep his, his promises, we can have the faith of God in our lives that brings us the peace and assurance that all of our hearts long for. The fulfilled prophecies and promises of God over the course of redemptive history give us the confidence and assurance that when God makes a promise or he says he's going to do something, we can always take his word to the bank. This is the picture of of God's love for us. It is his steadfast love and covenant faithfulness. It's captured by the Hebrew word chesed, 
I don't know if you remember back when, in, in when we studied the book of Ruth together, we kind of did a deep dive on this word, chesed. Chesed refers to the covenant faithfulness of God, where despite our unfaithfulness, God fulfills his covenant promises to his people, which all find their ultimate fulfillment in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And so this finally brings us to our third and final question in our study together this morning. How does the gift of faith work in our lives? And so let's go ahead. I want to read Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34 together, that point to that fulfillment of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. We read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the good news of the new covenant. The fulfillment of God's promises in Jesus Christ. And what we see is that our salvation is a work of God's faithfulness. That in our sin, we were by definition unfaithful completely unable to save ourselves, which is why we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, that this is the gift of faith that is made possible at Christmas. It is God's faithfulness in the midst of, of our unfaithfulness. It's his chesed, it's his steadfast love that results in him offering to us the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. That when we, by grace, through faith, trust in Jesus Christ alone to be our Lord and Savior, we go from being dead in our sins to becoming a new creation, alive in Christ. That our status changes from being enemies of God to being adopted into his very family, living now as his spirit-filled covenant people, his church on mission for his glory. And so to answer our question, how does the gift of faith work in our lives? The result of the gift of faith is a transformed life in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. The result of the gift of faith is a transformed life in Christ Jesus, that through our surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, a gradual transformation will take place in our lives. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, this, we receive the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does is there's this gradual transformation takes place, right? right? The word we call is, is sanctification. We're sanctified. That it's the process of becoming holy in the way God is holy. Right? And so we go through this process as we continually surrender and submit to the will of God in our lives. And what happens is, is this change, this transformation takes place where we begin to look more like Jesus. We, we be, what happens is, is we begin to love the things God loves, right? And hate the things God hates. The things that breaks God's heart breaks our heart. And we will gain a desire to follow after Jesus in faith by following after his example, be, by being compelled to live the way that Jesus lived, whether it be helping those in need, serving those around us, being a blessing to our neighbor and our community, being kind and forgiving instead of routinely returning evil with evil, and having a heart to share the good news of, of the kingdom, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, to dig deep into God's word, to commune with him in prayer, and just leading generous lives, using everything God has blessed us with to further the gospel and to seek first the kingdom of God. And so this is the result 
of transforming faith in our lives. That it extends far beyond an intellectual understanding of who God is. Because listen to me, genuine biblical faith results in action. Again, that's worthy of saying twice. That biblical faith extends far beyond an intellectual understanding of who God is because genuine biblical faith always results in action. We read in James 2, 18 and 19, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. In other words, talk is cheap. It's not enough to just say that we believe in God, but we are called to fully surrender to God by humbling ourselves, by by turning away from our sin and taking that step of faith in obedience to God by making Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior because sincere, genuine faith will always result in a transformed life. And so my final question to you this morning is this. Do you desire that transformation in your life? Because maybe you find yourself in a place this morning where God's been working on your heart, that you've seen God work in your life. And and what's been happening is is that slowly you've just been brought to the, the realization that the way you've been living your life, it doesn't matter how long it may be, that, that your way, in opposition to God's way, it just doesn't work. That going at it alone, in our own strength, apart from God, right, pursuing our own agenda instead of God's agenda, trying to build for ourselves our own kingdom instead of seeking first God's kingdom, what we found firsthand, our experiences, is with, without, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this is a recipe for disaster. That it only ends in pain and brokenness and despair. And so maybe you're even someone who's experienced a ton of success in your life. But you've arrived at the conclusion that the things that the world told you, that you've been conditioned your whole entire life, the things that the world told you that would bring you happiness and fulfillment, that instead it's, it just left you feeling empty and, and unsatisfied and incomplete. And so what I want to do is right now, I want to invite you to receive the transformation and the fulfillment that only comes from having the presence of God living at the center of your life. And this only comes by the gift of faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And so know what it is to have the assurance of things hoped for. Know what it is to have the peace of God that guards our hearts and minds from the the, the craziness and the nonsense that, that is just so prevalent in our world. Know the joy that is the steadfast love of God living at the center of our lives because that is the gift of Christmas. That it is the gift of faith in Jesus Christ.